Hi everyone, it's Gemma Ware here from The Conversation. I'm now back from maternity leave and getting reacquainted with my quite dusty microphone. We're working on some great new stories for you from The Conversation in September. But in the meantime, we wanted to bring you another episode from Fear and Wonder, a recent series about climate change from The Conversation. It's a podcast taking you inside the latest synthesis report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, through conversations with the scientists who wrote it. It's hosted by IPCC lead author Dr. Joelle Gerges and her friend, journalist Michael Green. In this episode you're about to hear, Joelle and Michael explore how climate change is already forcing around half of all life on Earth to move. That species all over the world changing where they live. To find out what's happening, they talk to a fisherman scientist up in Finland and an ecologist diving off the Tasmanian coast. We ran a couple of other episodes from the series earlier in the year, and you can scroll back through our feed to find them. If you want to find the rest of the series, search for Fear and Wonder wherever you listen to your podcasts or click on the link in our show notes. Okay, here we go. This is Fear and Wonder, brought to you by The Conversation. In this series, we're taking you inside the UN's era-defining climate report by the hearts and minds of the scientists from all around the world who wrote it. My name is Tero Mustonen, and I'm a geographer and fisherman. Of all the people I spoke to for this show, I think I was most intrigued to speak to Tero. I chatted with him in his home in a village named Selkje in North Karelia in Finland. It's a region that's northwest of Helsinki on the border with Russia. And Tero is the village head. We have 300 people and it's the second oldest settlement in North Karelia that we know of. It's therefore considered to be a cultural heritage area in Finland. And as he said, he's a professional fisherman. In the summer, in the open water, when there is no ice and no snow, we are harvesting with gill nets, fish traps and seining. And then when the ice comes, this is the winter, this means the lakes will freeze and there's ice and snow. Then we are fishing with the gill nets under the ice and we can also use seining, which is an active pulling of the nets under the ice daily to catch mostly schooling fish like Vendes or European Cisco. We're listening to the sounds of fishermen using this method of net fishing called seining from a film that Terra made. And they use chainsaws to cut a long rectangular hole in the ice so that they can then draw the net underneath. Do you still fish both seasons or when, when, are, you, when are you out there? Uh, I'm out there every week, so I fish through the year. Wow. That's actually how I financed my work on the IPCC panel. You're actually volunteering your time. And uh, I decided to keep keep going as a fisherman because that's how I earn my living. The, the fishermen that are working on the ice are actually just so in touch with the reality of a really rapidly changing landscape. And, you know, what a vantage point to be able to speak to someone who's actually watching those changes unfold. One of the most beautiful things that... I have been able to witness is when a good high pressure comes in, there's low low temperatures and the ice starts to form and it will sing or it will make certain outstanding and amazing sounds. And these sounds and the songs will have some cultural meaning and, and something for us internally, but they are one of those indicators that we know high quality ice is forming. By welcoming those nights when the ice is singing and we know many things, including the fact that new season is starting, we are getting good ice conditions, we welcome this. These are, in a way, indicators of a healthy winter on its way. Unfortunately, nowadays we have started to get those days when when that happens and then perhaps two weeks later a very warm spell comes and all the ice will leave us. It was a hot summer's day last year when I first spoke to Tero, and it made me very curious about what was going to happen in the winter to come. I can't think of any more powerful symbol of climate change here than getting into the winter as it used to be, and then suddenly, boom, there's a warm spell and everything's back to, like, 
eternal October conditions that will last all the way to February nowadays and and we have to wait for months and months and months before we can start to fish or travel on the ice. You're listening to Fear and Wonder, brought to you by The Conversation. I'm Dr Joel Gerges, and I'm a climate scientist at the Australian National University. I'm also a lead author on the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I'm Michael Green. I'm a journalist and a friend of Joel's. And in this podcast, we're exploring the life of these hugely influential IPCC reports and the kind of thinking and feeling that goes into them. So this show's all about finding out about the science and the people behind the headlines. In this episode, we're investigating what different species are doing to cope with climate change and some things that humans can do to help them. And we're doing that in conversation with two researchers who are involved with fisheries at opposite ends of the earth. So in the series so far, we've been speaking to scientists who worked on the first part of the report, which deals with the physical science basis. So that's the part that I worked on. It's the underpinning science of climate change. But today we're venturing into the second volume, which assesses the impacts, adaptation and vulnerability of ecosystems and different communities. Joel, like all parts of the IPCC report, it is a huge document. It's over 3,000 pages and there are chapters for land and sea and water and food and cities and health and poverty and also for each continent. And then there are cross-chapter papers on different regions and land types And for me, it was quite overwhelming when I tried to read it. Yeah, that's right. There's just so much really valuable information in there. And so this is the volume compiled by Working Group 2, which really highlights that interdependence between climate ecosystems and human societies. So we're starting to see more widespread and disruptive changes than we expected even just 20 years ago. And we can see that climate change is now really starting to amplify existing stresses like biodiversity loss, the unsustainable consumption of natural resources, land degradation and rapid urbanisation. These were problems that the world already faced before global warming really started to ramp up. But now those changes are having really major impacts on the natural world. I think we need to call an ecologist. I'm Professor Greta Petzl and I'm an ecologist by training. Greta is a marine ecologist at the University of Tasmania. For the Australasian chapter, I think there was a a lot of recognition that some of the really big impacts of climate change are happening on our continent, in, in our country. And that was the case when we were at the IPCC meetings as well. You know, at one meeting we were at, the country was on fire. At the next meeting we were at, the whole country was flooding, or it felt like the whole country was flooding. Ongoing and widespread flooding in eastern Australia, where people have lost lives and livelihoods to the rising water. Our report for IPCC was delivered in 2022, again as our country was flooding. A dire warning from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that over three billion people, nearly half the planet's population, are living in harm's way because of global warming. When the report was released, the Secretary-General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, made some startling comments. I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Today's IPCC report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. With fact upon fact, this report reveals how people on the planet are getting clobbered by climate change. As Greta said, literally the day it came out, several parts of Australia were hit by massive floods, including up where you live, Joelle. It really was unbelievable how things played out. My family in northern New South Wales were flooded out of their homes in the town of Lismore, and my sister-in-law's home was flooded to the rooftop. They literally swam off the veranda. It was It was bad. I mean, it kept rising, but they knew at that point they had to go and it came up real quick. I remember that was one of the most stressful weeks of my life. And then this report was coming out, so my phone was ringing with media as well. So it was really intense because I was teaching a university course called Fire, Flood and Drought at that very same time and giving lectures on what causes flooding in Australia. That week, as the report came out, every part of my life just felt like I was under siege from the impacts of climate change, it was, it was awful. I think as a climate change scientist, you actively have to cultivate a bit of distance 
from what you do during the day with your day job, because it is pretty frightening stuff. You know, I, f I found, for example, I'd be at work and I would be writing about how the Great Barrier Reef, you know, will have very frequent bleaching in the next decade and it needs over a decade to recover. And so there's pretty much, it's not rocket science to figure out that the trajectory for the Great Barrier Reef is really, really grim. I'd be writing that at work and then I would come home and my kids would be arguing over whose turn it was to stack the dishwasher. It just, it was, and I'd have to remind myself that just because my day job is, you know, assessing and reporting on and writing about the future of our planet, essentially, that doesn't mean that all these day-to-day -day things in my kids' lives and my life are not still important. These are all still important, but it feels like you're living in this dual reality in a way. Did you try that line on them at all? Like, guys, no, <laughs> the reef is dying. Just stack the dishwasher. <laughs> I did, literally did have to work pretty hard at just constantly reminding myself that the day-to-day -day things are still important and it's not fair really to push all the, you know, big problems of the world onto my, onto my kids, although that was very tempting sometimes. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit here. Back before Greta had those kids who now occasionally argue about the dishwasher to a time when she was starting out in her career and first noticing some changes that were happening in the marine environment. So I was working on the east coast of Tasmania from around the mid-90s. That's really when I first started scuba diving and it was, you know, an amazingly beautiful place. There were still kelp forests around, very, you know, lush inshore rocky reef habitats with lots of rock lobster and abalone and all those sorts of, you know, amazing reef fishes that we have. And even earlier than that, Giant kelp, which is a huge brown seaweed, was so common and widespread that it was actually marked on shipping charts. You might have seen those beautiful pictures of the giant strands of kelp that, you know, go from the ocean floor to the top of the ocean surface and that old boats used to worry about getting tangled up in these really lush kelp forests. They were so, so big and prevalent along the east coast of Tasmania. Greta started off studying squid growth and reproduction and what was happening in the squid fishery. So I had a coxswain's boat ticket and would be, you know, skippering boats and doing fishing and, and diving, a lot of diving. So we were in the water about four or five months of the year. Lots of counting squid eggs. <laughs> I've counted millions and millions of squid eggs in my lifetime. Wow. How do you, how do you count squid <laughs> eggs? Uh, if we were doing inshore dives and you'd drop a transect line down and swim along the transect line and pushing all the seagrass out of the way to try and look at the eggs on the bottom and, and count, you know, how many eggs per unit area. So the waters off the east coast of Tasmania are warming at four times the global average. While I was diving there with our squid surveys, every now and again we'd spot some sort of, you know, species that we thought really didn't belong off the east coast of Tasmania. And, and so it was kind of interesting starting my work off and being in this place where we really were starting to see some of these changes so early on. We get what I call a double whammy. We get the underlying warming that most of the rest of the ocean has and there's a change in current system. And the East Coast is very heavily influenced by the East Australian current. So that's the current that brought Nemo's dad cruising down the, the coast past Sydney there in that, in that Disney movie. So that's Finding Nemo. I actually haven't seen the movie. It's actually a really lovely little story about this clownfish that gets stuck in the East Australian current and goes all the way down the coast. And the East Australian current pushes down the coast and it comes into Tasmania in summer and then it retreats in winter. But what's happening is the atmosphere above the Pacific Ocean is warming. So the air above the ocean, as that's warming up, it literally spins up the wind field and that wind field is physically forcing the East Australian current further and faster down the coast. And so the East Australian current now sits off Tasmania 
for a larger part of the year. And the kind of temperature that we've got off the East Coast now, it's, it's moved something like 350 kilometres further south in about 70 years or so. It's a pretty rapid change in terms of temperature change. So after the millions of squid eggs, Greta's next job was working with the rock lobster fishery. And she did a survey asking people in the industry what they thought of climate change. Around 80% of the fishers in that industry didn't think climate change was an issue. When we got the same group of fishers in a workshop, we said, OK, let's not worry about climate change. Just tell me the kinds of changes that you're seeing. And they had a list of changes in the marine environment as long as your arm, all these new species turning up and things that weren't there anymore and species spawning earlier and all sorts of changes that were entirely consistent with what we understood about climate change. And in the room, you could see people going, oh, oh, I've seen one of those. Oh, yeah, I saw that too. Oh, hang on a minute. And so I thought, well, what if we have a mechanism to take all those observations from the fishers and turn it into data? So Greta started a citizen science project called RedMap, where fishers and divers could send in photos and observations of the species they are starting to notice in new locations. And using this information, scientists can get more data points on the movement of species, which is really important for understanding how climate change is impacting marine ecosystems. Ecology is all about what lives where and why. That's pretty much ecology in a, in a nutshell. And what we're finding with climate change is that there's literally a redistribution of life on Earth. And, and even though I work on that area, I find it utterly mind-blowing that, you know, we've not seen a change in the distribution of species for at least tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years, like what we're living through. And, and you know, it's an experiment on the planet and it allows us as scientists to look at, well, why do things live there and why are they shifting now? And it's fascinating ecologically. It's just a pity that it's a really shitty experiment because it's, you know, mostly negative impacts. One of the most remarkable statements of the IPCC report was that about half of the species assessed globally have been on the move. And Greta published a really important synthesis paper that collated all the evidence from around the world in terms of how we know about this rapid redistribution of life on Earth. So northern hemisphere plants and animals are going north, southern hemisphere they're going south. On land they're going to higher elevations, so moving, you know, higher up mountaintops and in the ocean going to deeper depths. And all of these plants and animals are, generally speaking, tracking their preferred environmental conditions. So they're not changing what they do or what they like. They're just either actively moving to these new regions that now suit the kind of conditions that they need, or they may have always been dispersed or gone to those regions but just not survived well, and now they're able to survive much better. So it's a combination of active movement and survival. And in other cases, it might be things like the predator that used to be in that region has now shifted because of climate, and that means this other species can move into that region. So it's pretty pretty complex, but in general... Plants and animals are moving faster in the ocean than they are on land. And again, we we think that's for a whole range of reasons, but in the ocean, there's fewer barriers. So there's, you know, we don't have roads and highways and big cities in the way that will break up that habitat connectivity and the potential for those species to occupy all their niches. And so what are we talking about? Like how, how much are these species moving There's species that have moved like, you know, thousands of kilometres. Most marine species, though, are moving on average around 70, 75 kilometres a decade. So that's not huge distances. But then you have other species like the long-spined sea urchin, so a little urchin critter that has moved probably 350, 400 kilometres in a decade or two decades 
further down the coast of Tasmania. It's so like a little round ball with these enormous long spikes sticking out. It's one of the spikiest things I've ever seen. And some of those long spikes look like they're probably about 30 centimetres. Because that's a species that eats a lot of kelp, eats a lot of plant material, it has really transformed the east coast of Tasmania. It's changed it from lush kelp forests to rocky urchin barrens, literally called urchin barrens because they're barren. Because that's changed the habitat, that then changes the whole suite of species that uses those areas. So there's a couple of habitat forming species that have made massive changes. So half of life on Earth looks like it's already changing where it lives. We don't know a lot as scientists about what does that mean for the ecosystem as a whole. We're still at the stage of going, oh, has this species shifted or how far has this lobster moved or I wonder how quickly this octopus is going to shift or what will it eat. But we're still at a really sort of single species looking at little parts of it and we don't really understand, well, what does that mean for the actual entire ecosystem function? Yeah, because the kelp didn't get a chance to move 350 kilometres, right? That's right, yeah. It's not like everything's just shifting down. No, yeah. You've hit the nail on the head there. Things are shifting at different rates. And so that means a whole lot of connections between species getting broken and new connections being made. So a whole lot of yeah, trophic interactions that are all, all being completely altered and turned on their head. So when Greta says trophic here, she's referring to the feeding relationships between organisms in an ecosystem. The way Greta's explained it really, I find it really clear how like just the whole system is different to what it used to be. Yeah, and so that web of life really is starting to kind of come apart and what's kind of interesting about what Greta's saying as well is that a lot of ecologists just focus on sort of species level changes but how they interact in terms of their ecosystems is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of understanding climate change. If you pull one part of the system in terms of pulling a thread is the rest going to start to unravel? And we don't know that yet, but we can start to see the changes and, and it's being monitored by people like Greta. You're listening to Fear and Wonder. Stay with us. We'll be back after a short break. Hello, I'm Tim Flannery, Chief Counselor of the Climate Council. We're proud sponsors of the Fear and Wonder podcast. The Climate Council is Australia's own independent, evidence-based organisation on climate science, impacts and solutions. We need urgent action on climate now. But to make this happen, we need your ongoing support. Make a weekly or monthly commitment to combat the climate crisis with us. Sign up as a new member in April and you'll receive a copy of Joel Gerges' book, Humanity's Moment. Head to climatecouncil.org.au slash the conversation today to find out more about how you can help drive the urgent change we need. Hi, I'm Signa Dean, Science and Technology Editor at The Conversation Australia. Scientists do vital work to help us understand our world. If you're curious about science, you love our new weekly newsletter, Science Wrap. Each week, we cover the latest news, discoveries, and deep dives on everything from cosmology to artificial intelligence, climate science, medicine, and much more. Subscribe via the link in the show notes. Okay, we're back with Fear and Wonder, but while we're promoting things, let's promote the show. So if you're listening and you're enjoying it, please rate and review and share the show with everyone you can. So Joelle, in this episode, we've been hearing about the species that are on the move in response to global warming. And at the start of the episode, we spoke to Tero Mustanen, and I actually called him again just a few weeks ago. It was about half a year after I first spoke to him. Can you tell me about what happened with the Lycos this winter? Yeah, so for the winter 2022 to 23, we had perhaps one week of very cold, proper temperatures that started to form the ice, what we call steel ice or high quality ice. But then this year we had very mild and warm temperatures 
Finland had an exceptionally warm January. Data from the Finnish Meteorological Institute showed that average temperatures in some regions were two to five degrees higher than in the past 30 years. This is what he was worried about, right? This is what he was saying that he was concerned would happen. The ice that forms is called Kohovaja, and it's a very low quality ice. We could translate this roughly as slush ice. And its proportions and qualities are very different than steel ice or, or the so-called safe ice that we need for our fishery and safe travel on the ice and so on. He sounded pretty despondent about it, actually. Right now, in, in early March, things got a bit better. There was a cold spell towards the end of February, and now now things are somewhat better, but that's where we are. OK, so before we continue with Tero, let's kind of reacquaint ourselves with our location, seeing as we've come from Tasmania, deep down in the Southern Hemisphere. When I was chatting with Tero, he was talking about the Arctic and the Boreal. So the Arctic is the most northerly part of the planet, the North Pole, if you like, and the Arctic Circle is located around 66 degrees north and is mostly a treeless tundra covered by glaciers, ice and snow. And located just south of this treeless tundra is covered by what is referred to as the boreal forests. It's a belt of conifer forests or pine forests that extend from the Pacific coast of Russia, wrapping all the way around to Finland, Sweden and over to Canada and Alaska. So Terra's village is located in the boreal region of Finland. How did you get involved in science, in in becoming a geographer? Well, I have always had two jobs, so I grew up in a boreal fishing family and very early on I was part-time subsistence and commercially harvesting with my father. We were selling crayfish to local hotels and so on and so on. And then when I got to be 18 I started to apprentice under a really old professional fisherman before embarking on that career myself and I was trying to think how could we be trying to communicate the life on the ice and in the snow and on the lakes in ways that would be understood by science? He's got a really, really interesting perspective, I think, which is that part of the lived experience of understanding how the world is changing right now. So it's not climate change in the future or these projected changes. It's about right now. And my own passion for this work was that I felt that the Finnish traditional knowledge associated with the waters was extremely important. And the changes that were affecting our ice-based fishery were dramatic. We had lost by late 1990s already perhaps one third of the ice cover in the winter. And none of that was reflected in the literature or authorities deciding on how fishing can happen. And I really strongly felt that there's a gap in science, that something should be done to communicate and study how these different knowledge systems are viewing the same change from multiple sides. And of course, like so many other traditional knowledge systems, our cultural knowledge contains ethics and morals about how to be on the lakes and rivers. And and that was completely missing from a lot of the early conversations on geographical study of climate change in the north. So that's why Tero and others founded this NGO Snow Change Cooperative, expressly with this idea of combining traditional and on-the-ground knowledge with scientific analysis. We had people from the local communities in the Boreal, the Finnish fishermen like myself included, and then we partnered with Inuit people from Canada and some of the indigenous Sami people who are linguistically related to Finnish people, the Sami, we felt that a lot of the villages and, and the communities in the Arctic have to be having a place to communicate directly what's going on on the ground. But on the other hand, we knew that we need a very solid and good science part. That's why the organization has always had a, a biodiversity and climate unit. So, Joel, why is the Arctic warming so fast? Different regions of the Earth are warming more rapidly than others because of their climatological features. And the best known example of this is called polar amplification, where warming is far more pronounced in the Arctic compared to the rest of the world. 
And this is primarily because of the melting of snow and ice, which reveals darker land or ocean underneath, which increases the amount of solar radiation that can be absorbed at the surface instead of being reflected back into space. And as a result, annual Arctic temperatures have already increased at a rate at least three times higher than the global average. And the most recent estimates suggest that this number could actually be closer to nearly four times higher than the global average, with the region warming around three degrees since 1979, which is phenomenally fast. So that's three degrees of warming that's occurred in my own lifetime. The Arctic was one of the earliest places where we could really see how climate change is altering the dynamics of whole ecosystems. Of course, life in the Arctic and North is cyclic, but the current populations of animals and ecosystems, they have been evolving in the boreal and the Arctic to the cold conditions and the stable winter conditions for the past 10,000 years. We have animals that are depending on those cold conditions or a proper winter and ice for survival. For example, if we don't have snow, the snowy hare will have a lot of difficulty because he will change his fur into white, but it's, if it's all black in the forest, they will be hunted easily by predators. So the hare turns white in winter, so it's camouflaged against the snow. But then if it doesn't snow, you've just got a bright white bunny waiting to be eaten. Poor thing. Or cold water fish like vendes, whitefish, salmon, trout and so on, they can't survive extreme heat because they are very dependent on the cold waters and the oxygen levels that are associated with cold waters. Okay, so this ties directly into what Greta was talking about earlier with species movements. And actually, Tero was a co-author on that really prominent paper of Greta's that we mentioned, the one that summarises what we know about species movement all over the globe. It was actually referenced a lot in the IPCC report. And for the boreal, it gave the example of pests like bark beetles moving northward and upslope. And with hotter temperatures and more droughts, pest outbreaks are getting worse and tree diebacks are too. And in turn, that increases fire frequency and the release of more carbon dioxide. So there's these kind of cascading impacts. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then, of course, climate change is not the only threat to these animals and plants. In Finland, the complexity is that we have very intense land use, forestry, forest management, mining, combined with the increasingly impactful climate change events. And the combination of these two things is very often an extremely hard case for the animals and the fish and the birds and so on. So Tero was telling me about this long-term project that he's been a part of, that he's been working on with the Sami communities on the Finnish and the Russian side of the border. We were trying to link the best possible science that we are doing, for example, on climate and measuring temperatures and water quality and so on and so on, with what's going on from the Indigenous side. What, What are they saying? What are they observing? Following this dialogue, we were able to have a range of novel discoveries, for example, the very first microplastics in freshwater ecosystems in the Arctic were discovered last year, led by the Sami, because they they had a very interesting notion of sensing or feeling that something is out of place in one part of a river called Nathamund. We were then able to go there with, with a science team and conduct very intricate measurements of microplastics and, and were able to confirm that indeed, even though this is the most remote part of Europe, pollution events have happened there as well. One interesting thing is that Tero and Greta have been part of a larger group of scientists and Indigenous people, Indigenous researchers, who've been working for many years to try to increase the inclusion of Indigenous knowledge in the IPCC. So we tend to focus on peer-reviewed papers that are corroborated across many studies that use these reproducible methods that can be tested by other scientists independently. So that's actually really important, that it isn't just a single observation in a single place. It's something that can be seen, you know, in different parts of the world. But for the sixth assessment report, there were also efforts to try and increase the number of Indigenous contributing authors involved in the IPCC assessment to try and get some of that really valuable information into the assessment. And there were also improved processes for Indigenous people to contribute to a technical report on climate change and Indigenous knowledge. So 
it was a start. And I know that the Australian government has established a working group to also try and improve the representation of Indigenous knowledge in the next IPCC cycle. But obviously, there's still a long way to go, but we have come a really long way as well. The research work that Tero was talking about with the Sami sounds like a super interesting project kind of along those lines, right? Yeah, I looked into it. It's a really amazing project called Traditional Knowledge of Northern Waters that combined around 9,000 data items, including Indigenous knowledge, oral histories, traditional song, and also historical weather records spanning all the way back to 1863. And the project highlighted that climate change is now an urgent reality that is affecting the health of many ecosystems and communities in the Arctic. One of the things that really came forwards from this work was the notion of Indigenous-led rewilding or restoration of ecosystems, mostly for rivers. And the logic behind that was that the Sami are co-dependent on the non-human species like the Arctic char and crayling and trout. And these northern fish are doing very poorly when the climate impacts are moving the temperatures up to plus 30 and beyond. So the necessity and decision by the Sami was that why don't we try to restore altered habitats and restore river systems back into health to buy more time, habitat and spawning areas for these fish so that they have a fighting chance. So this part of the IPCC report we're talking about today is about impacts and adaptation. And what Terro is describing here is an adaptation project to try and give those fish a fighting chance to be able to cope with warming temperatures. When I called Tero the other week, it actually turned out that he'd just returned from a visit up north to go and work on that project. Since we last spoke, we have continued that work and it's actually going on right now, today, on one lake restoration up there. They're trying to undo some of the damage that had been done over the last half century, when the waterways had been cleared for boat access and timber floating, often in employment programs for the Sami. For example, this village of Sevetiarvi didn't have a road until late 1970s to 80s, and mail and crucial supplies were delivered by boats. And these actions, probably well-meaning at the time, were commissioned to alter and change the waterways. This kind of disruption unravels the web of life that's evolved from the shape of the riverbed to the seasonal flow of water through those ecosystems. And it means that the fish might not be able to spawn in those places that they used to. And so the task is to try and reverse that damage. You have to think like a fish. You have to think, where would I eat? Where would I have sex? Where could I meet somebody that I like? Where would my children grow up? Where where can I make sure that they are not eaten by the big bad pike? And in physical terms, it involves often installing boulders and big rocks back into the currents so that the stream is not only like a one-way highway, it starts to meander, the water starts to slow down behind these big boulders, and it's able to um, function as a spawning habitat. There's a moment where our knowledge will end. Then elders like Risto Semenov, who is one of the knowledgeable people, he's now 70, will step in and say, Yeah, that's all fine on a big scale, but now we put the actual boulders here, here and here, because I remember from 1969 when they took them from here and here and here. We're basically talking about how you want to improve, you know, the resilience of ecosystems, but also that just relying on nature alone isn't enough and that humans actually have to intervene and be better custodians of these these natural places to be able to try and keep pace with climate change and, and to try and adapt to the sort of you know, climate extremes that are being experienced in, in these parts of the world. Does it seem to be going well, the project? The careful monitoring that we do is has shown that, the, for example, the, the mother fish have accepted our restored sites And um, on some sites, we have about five years of data. Not all spawning sites are being used, but they are being used. Tero's organisation, Snow Change, has really scaled up its work on adaptation and rewilding. But there's actually a really beautiful story about how it all began right in Tero's village with a peatland mining site called Linunsuo. Well, Linnosuo used to be a pristine peatland in 1980s, and then in Finland, the government and the industry started to come up with a way of producing energy that involved peat. 
if you try it, it becomes fuel. PEEP is really just decomposing organic material that's sort of accumulating up in bogs and swampy areas. For me, it seems like a bit like it's like pre-coal. It would be coal if it had a few million years to be crushed and <laughs> Yeah, exactly compressed. right, actually. That's exactly what it is, yeah. I'm making progress. <laughs> You'll get an honorary degree by the end of this, Mike. <laughs> the trouble with that is that it's causing a range of environmental pollution events. It's more toxic to the atmosphere than coal, but it's also causing a lot of downstream water impacts and so on and so on. We had a mine like that in our village between 1984 and 2010. That's connected with a small river called Yukayoki, which is very important to our village. And then in 2010, there was a large pollution event where all the fish died from this peat mining site called Linusuo. And we were able to facilitate the process where the mining ended and the company left the site. Snow Change decided to try to buy the peatland mining site from the company. Finally, the talks succeeded and we launched into this large rewilding and restoration process for the whole peatland and also the whole subsequent river catchment. The comeback of biodiversity has been astounding and also the benefits for climate are quite important because the northern peatlands are storing one third of world soil-based carbon. So we were able to stop soil-based emissions of CO2 and slowly, of course, start to nurture the habitat back into a carbon sink. And the most important thing that came out of Linnosaur was that Snow Change was able to proliferate this model of community-led and traditional knowledge-led rewilding into the landscape rewilding program that's currently having 52,000 hectares under influence and, and over 65 sites across the country. So after they'd begun to restore the wetlands, Tero was spending a lot of time there observing what was happening. And that's where he was one October evening. And uh, spending some time there, and suddenly at sundown, we got these thousands and thousands of geese that started to circle and land on the wetland. I think we calculated in the excess of 30,000 birds that had come there for the night and to rest and feed and... and uh, this was a very powerful sign to us that nature has accepted the things that we are doing. Tero sent me some bird recordings from the rewilding site and we're listening to one of them with the calls of the spotted crake, the common reed warbler and the whooper swan. That's the one that's whooping. If we dismiss all the cultural narratives, in scientific and ecological terms, these are massively important numbers for the northern, shall we say, recovery. Finland has over 400 bird species recorded in all of its history, and to have over one half of those coming back to the wetland after rewilding shows that it's an extremely important message in solution space when the world is burning and everybody's asking what to do and how to do that fast. And, and we have found out that this kind of uh, well done science-based, but also traditional knowledge-based rewilding and restoration of habitats may be one of our best solutions in an orderly transition from the current place to a better future. Now, that better future, unfortunately, will contain warming we are not here to stop climate change on the short term, but we will have much better planet when we have restored and rewilded a lot of the space that we could be doing, as opposed to where we are now. So, Joel. In this episode, we've been hearing about the species that are on the move because of climate change. For me, that's probably the take home of this episode is that half of life on Earth is on the move because of climate change already. And I think that's, you know, it's a staggering statistic. And then the cascading impacts throughout, you know, the different ecosystems all around the world from pole to pole is really profound. 
The other really interesting thing I think from this episode is just thinking about how when humans do intervene and take on that custodian role, that nature will respond and recover. This idea of rewilding and restoring ecosystems and land degradation and that sort of thing is really, really important. And it's reasons for optimism, I think. Fear and Wonder is produced by me, Michael Green, and co-hosted by Dr Joelle Gerges from the Australian National University. With sound design and engineering and extra wisdom from John Chia, script editing by Nicole Kirby. Thanks to the show's executive producer, Ben Clark, and the conversations editor, Misha Ketchell. Fear and Wonder is sponsored by the Climate Council. We recorded on Wurundjeri land at the State Library of Victoria. Thank you to Tero Mustanen for the sounds of the fishing, from a short film called The Winter Saners of Puravesi, and also for sharing the recordings of birdsong at Linun Suo. Thanks also to the Finnish national broadcaster for the sound of the lake ice forming. It was recorded back in 1989, a little to the north of Tero's village. Joelle wrote about her experience as an IPCC author in her new book, which is called Humanity's Moment, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope. If you've enjoyed this episode of Fear and Wonder, do subscribe to their podcast to hear the rest of the series. Search for Fear and Wonder wherever you listen to podcasts or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. We'll be back in a few weeks. Thanks for listening.